This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. I am Dalia Shenlin. And I am Gennad Halpern. After a six-month hiatus, we are very happy to launch a new series in collaboration with our long-standing partner, the Israel Office of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. There is therefore no better way to kick off this new series entitled Israel Behind the Headlines than a conversation with Professor Norbert Lammert, the chairman of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, who is now in Israel celebrating 40 years of activity in the country. Professor Lammert uh, was appointed in 2018 after serving as member of the Bundestag for almost four decades, including as president of the House between 2005 and 2017. Professor Lammert is a political scientist and gained his PhD at the University of Oxford. And we're now very delighted to have him here in Tel Aviv. Professor Norbert Lammert, hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Hello. Thank you for the invitation. So the, the previous series of podcasts that we produced with, with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, were, were dedicated to the crisis of liberal democracy, uh, the threat of populism, etc. And indeed, when we started in 2017, it seemed like a serious threat to the political order in the West. And despite several setbacks, like the defeat of Donald Trump, populism remains a threat, but it seems that it pales in comparison to the threat that is now po- posed by the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine uh, that actually served in a way to galvanize some of the principles and institutions that the populists were so keen to undermine. So do you think uh, that there's a link between the two phenomena, between the threat of populism and the invasion of Ukraine? Are these two complementary markers of our era? Rather, no as far as connection or a direct link is concerned. Unfortunately, the new challenge doesn't substitute the other. So we are confronted with not old, but visible challenge since some time with another rather unexpected uh, challenge of the last uh, months. And... um, The first still lasting challenge, unfortunately, doesn't make it easier to meet the second one. And to give you just one example, Putin definitely has underestimated the reaction of the West and uh, the reaction of the European Union uh, in particular. But within the European Union, some member states, and probably not just by accident, led by populist leaders, hesitate to join European reactions. And in so far, there is indeed a connection, but not a, in, in, in terms of uh, causal uh, links. Let me ask you about Germany's role and identity in that context. Uh, For so long, it's certainly uh, in terms of its leadership of Europe, but also in reality, Germany is held up as a paragon of liberal democracy in the post-war era, uh, and certainly a fixture of stability for Europe. Given how the last century went, I'm curious, how did it get to be in this role? How did Germany develop this very strong and stable liberal liberal democratic identity, even if there are, of course, elements of opposition? Well, fortunately, Germany is or seems to be less affected by populist uh, movements and new political groups, including election results than several other European states and non-European states. Including one big one. Including a particularly big one. And my explanation why it is as it is, is history. Although... There live only very, very few people in Germany uh, who have a biographic relationship 
to the first approach to establish a democracy in Germany and in so far might have a personal traumatic experience on how it ended and what the consequences are, this seems to be part of the German DNA. And in so far, political parties, new political leaders who obviously address extremist positions might get applause and might get some support, but they never reach majorities, hopefully, for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Do you think that the uh, risk exists, that at some point there will be, I don't know if a populist takeover, but some, you know, uh, uh, a major uh, uh, upheaval of the German well, political system? Uh, the risk exists because the democracy is, in structural terms, an unstable political system. It depends on majorities. And um, a serious functioning democracy disposes itself every four or five years, at least, when it organizes free elections, deciding each time which parties, which leaders might get the decisive mandates and positions. And it's so far you can't seriously say there is no risk. You should better say there is either a democracy and then there is a risk. Or you will avoid the risk by restricting democratic framework conditions. I have to ask, since you mentioned this very optimistic scenario in which democracies change their leadership every four or five years, how do you understand Israel in terms of where we are at this moment? Uh, you know, we are dissolving our leadership uh, every, four every, every four or five months. I mean, one might say we are about to enter our fifth election cycle in three years, massive instability. How does Germany see the Israeli political system? Or how do you see it from your perspective as a German politician? Well, uh, generally speaking, we are impressed by the democratic vitality of the uh, uh, political system in, uh, in Israel. And given the uh, particular regional framework conditions of uh, the only country with a serious democracy, it's even more impressive. On the other hand, we are, of course, uh, concerned that um, in Israel there seems a similar strong trend of misunderstanding political competition as a particular type of rivalry and defining competitors as enemies, if not as traitors, which unavoidably not only harms the culture of a political system, but creates a particular risk that at the end minorities don't accept the legitimacy of a government because of this principle objection in fundamental positions. While we're on, on Israel, I'd like to hear from you what do you see as the mission of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Israel and how you navigate it alongside the uh, German embassy and the German diplomatic mission? What, what's really the division of labor between the two of you? Well, the general um, uh, interest of the Adenauer Foundation is to, to offer experiences, hopefully competences, which we have made in Germany with a particular complicated uh, history and with remarkable achievements in terms of a stable democratic system in a second approach, which for international partners 
is perhaps an even more interesting offer than, let's say, a French or British proposal because the breakdown of approaches makes the German example even more illustrative in terms of risks and failures and of achievements uh, as well. So it is, of course, for us again or as well an encouraging experience that we, with very, very few exemptions, find partners in countries all over the world with precisely this joint interest. We don't come as missionaries. We aren't interested in, in, in transferring a German model. But we offer to share experiences and uh, developments and achievements as far as it is possible between different uh, countries at all. When it comes to Israel, we are, of course, not talking of one out of more than 100 countries in which the Adenauer Foundation is uh, represented, but with one out of, at most, five countries in the world, we have a particular relationship with and definitely want to have a particular relationship with that Israel was not the first country where the Arno Foundation was represented at all. Which was? The first two uh, have been Venezuela and Chile. And the reason is, um, at least at the second glimpse, uh, uh, quite uh, plausible. South America at that time, in the early uh, 60s, uh, was a continent with several countries being led by Christian democratic leaders, where Christian democratic parties played a significant role. I won't comment the present situation, I'm just explaining um, the historical uh, development. And at the same time, not even diplomatic relations between Germany and Israel have been started. So, given this particularly context, it is remarkable that uh, since 40 years now uh, we have this particular relationship uh, uh, between Germany and Israel in general and a particular cooperation of the Adenauer Foundation here in the country um, uh, as well and um, our celebration uh, uh, this week illustrated that it is perceived and understood from both sides as a unique type of relation and of cooperation. Since you mentioned South America, I am curious to ask, I noticed that in your pa in the past you were at one point chairman of the German-Brazilian Parliamentary Friendship Group, and I couldn't help but wonder how you compare the two experiences of being part of Germany's foreign policy with relation to Brazil and with relation to Israel. Obviously the histories are very different, but how does that play out? in developing these relationships? If we would seriously try to uh, uh, collect um, memories and uh, associations, uh, uh, mental associations uh, with two countries, we will need at least two hours to um, uh, uh, complete our point. Um, but I, I will concentrate on one which we have already mentioned in a general uh, uh, respect. When I became chairman of the German-Brazilian uh, uh, parliamentary group in the 80s, it was at a time when a transformation of authoritarian regimes in Latin America, being led by military personalities, by the army and not by parliaments, uh, uh, took place, at least have been started, And here again was a particularly interesting place for a foundation like uh, us. Uh, 
to offer our experiences, transformation from authoritarian structures to democratic and parliamentary uh, structures. In the meantime, a lot of hopes which we had on regard on the development in uh, Latin America has gone or are at least very much limited. And the observation once again is populism. And a glimpse at the situation indicates it is precisely the risks of democracy we have spoken uh, about. It is not a just easygoing procedure that in reliable periods of time an electorate decides once again who or which party should govern the country. And we are observing a global trend of populism and um, referring to an assumption which has been widespread again globally 30 years ago after the fall of the Berlin Wall, after the fall of authoritarian regimes in Middle and East, uh, Eastern Europe, after the replacement of authoritarian regimes by freely elected parliaments and democratically legitimized governments, we nearly all lived some time in the illusion that we have entered the ultimate area of democracy. Now we are observing a democratic recession, not only in number of serious democracies, but in the functioning of serious democracy. I'm hesitating to characterize one of the greatest and most important democracies in the world, a fully-fledged functioning democracy. And some years ago, I couldn't even have assumed to speculate on questions like this. In relation to the United States, I'm assuming. Right. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, well, about the, the international work of the foundation and other foundations... There's a um, somewhat populist or, uh, um, uh, or just a general criticism voiced here in Israel, I don't know about other places that you're active in, uh, that by investing German taxpayers' money, you're basically meddling in the internal affairs of the country, of Israel, through the back door. Um, do you see any uh, merit in this uh, argument? And if not, what do, you, what do you say to these people? And just to add that we do know how this plays out in some other countries where there have been leaders, populist leaders, who attack any foreign activity as some sort of foreign intervention to their politics. So it definitely is part of what we talk about when we talk about populism, is a xenophobic sense of accusing other actors of meddling. Well, after more than half a century of experiences in international uh, uh, cooperation, I could give you nearly an example for any kind of situation which you might assume. There have been countries where the director of our office had much more contact and influence on the respective government than the German ambassador. And there are other countries in which after some time, a short or a longer period of time, we have been forbidden to cooperate with which other institutions ever. Our last experience is Russia. We have immediately after the invasion in uh, Ukraine stopped our daily activities and closed our office and only a week or two weeks later we have formally lost our license, the allowance to work in the country. We have been forced not only to leave the country but um, uh, being put on uh, criminal charges uh, for our uh, uh, staff people in Egypt. 
uh, about 10 years ago. So whatever you might imagine could have happened, has happened already in our experience in hundred countries during more than 50, 60 years. Sadly, we have to end soon, so I will ask what might be the last question, unless Gilad wants to ask. Um, if we're talking about the importance of democracy and the importance of strengthening the international system, which is so gravely under threat because of the war right now, what do you think can be the priorities for both Germany and especially Germany in its relationship with Israel uh, in order to strengthen those values, both democracy and the international system? As a political foundation with the two major addresses, domestic work and international work, and a lot of pillars within these uh, uh, two directions, we have, of course, something like a general agenda, which we define and everybody can examine and decide whether he is interested in participating or not. But the efficiency and the appreciation of our work um, in other countries depends on the concrete relations and projects being found with uh, respective partners. And in so far, it is at least as much due to the initiative and the connections of the respective director of our office in the respective country which defines the type and mode and amount of cooperation as it is directives of the Berlin uh, central uh, office. And uh, this is not only true for Israel, but um, given the particular um, uh, occasion of 40 years, it was the unanimous reaction of our partners uh, during these uh, days that they appreciate precisely this type of joint ventures. Okay, uh, we'll have to end there. Professor Norbert Lambert, thank you very much for joining us today and to uh, another at least 40 years of successful activity in this realm. And also big thanks to Itai Shalem, the manager of TLV1 Studios, and once again to the Israel office of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation for their partnership and support for this series. And also a thank you to uh, Dalia, to you Dalia. Uh, now you're moving uh, to uh, other projects, but you will be staying on sporadically. But uh, this is a, uh, a good opportunity to say thank you for five years of very intense and uh, fruitful cooperation on this podcast. And I should be saying thank you for inviting me into the podcast five years ago, fateful five years and a wonderful five years. So many thanks to us and many thanks to you, our listeners, for bearing with us during our six-month break. And we look forward to your joining us again regularly as of next week. Mm -hmm.